Balbay Council can remind members that the meeting is being recorded and will be available for listening to the public. On the agenda today is a report from the S95 officer which updates us on the local government finance settlement and further detail on a number of areas we had been seeking clarity from the Deputy First Minister on. I can confirm that there have been no proposals from any political group or individual councillors to update our three-year budget today. However, I have circulated a discussion document from the Administration for Members' Information setting out the Administration's proposals for the next steps in the budget setting process, the recommendations of which I will be moving at item four. Rona, you have the Cedric and apologies, please. Yes, thank you, Leader. There are apologies from Councillors Geddes, <coughs> Nicol, Prentice and Wood. And as we start the meeting, Colin, Councillor Wiper and Councillor McGregor are, are not present. Uh, therefore, there are 41 members present at the start of the meeting. Thank you. Um, can I move on? Uh, item three, sorry, two, which is declarations of interest. Any members? No. Moving on to item three, the Council of Tax Community Charge Restriction and Voting. It's a legal requirement that a member who is two or more months in arrears of council tax does not have voting rights in relation to fixing the council tax and requires to make a declaration to that effect. We do not have any proposals on the table today to fix the council tax, so I can take it that members are disposed to note the terms of the report and move on. Just in governance terms, Leader, does that mean this will have to come back up on if it's deferred to 29th because circumstances yeah. could yeah. change in the interim? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Okay. Right, if we can um, move on to item four, which is the budget and council tax report by head of finance and procurement. The section 95 officer's report provides a comprehensive update on the factors this council needs to consider in updating our budget and setting council tax for 2016 17. In setting the council tax, we are required to do this based on an overall balanced budget for the year ahead. It provides information from the Deputy First Minister on the conditions he has attached to the settlement. At policy resources in January, we agreed that we needed clarification on these matters. I wrote to him following our meeting and asked for that clarification. I shared this correspondence with all elected members at that time. I can report that as of today, I have still not yet had a response to that letter. Although as reported in paragraph 4.4, along with all other council leaders, I did receive further information from the Deputy First Minister, along with a note from Paul Garrett. This letter was also shared with all elected members and a copy of the letter is also included at Appendix 1. Paul is here to answer any questions we have arising from the report. Uh, so I can ask if there's any questions out on the report before, for Paul before I move on to the next stage. Ivor. Chair, just clarification. My understanding was that it was possible to set a council tax, but we didn't need to set a budget today, and that the budget could follow at a future time. So you could actually say 0% today and then with a £11 million savings to be identified within a budget process. Okay, it's a lip full answer, but it's my understanding that the, the council tax set has to be part of a balanced budget, and as we don't have a balanced budget for this for the following year, I think that's the case. That's correct, Leader. I tried to explain to members that section 3 of the report what, what's known as the, the balanced budget requirement. Effectively, when you're setting your council tax, you're doing that based on the money you need to raise to balance your budget. So effectively, you need to do both at the same time. Ian. Thanks, Leader. Just, just in as far as with some correspondence earlier on in the week, it just the, the timelines is the only thing I'm looking for, Leader, in as far as the response to John Swinney's letter. Did we comply with the timelines 
taking that as being part of the report with letters in there. Uh, did we actually comply with the timelines? I think we did, from, from what I can gather. Just clarity on that. Did we meet the 9th, uh, the 9th of February timeline? Yeah, I did send out a letter. I did send out a copy to every member. I know that it did say it's complied with it, but no. 9th of February on it. I, will now, I want to turn now to looking at the next steps in the budget setting process. <clears throat> when we agreed a three-year budget last year, it was a budget that showed a clear determination to deliver on our priorities. Building the local economy, including our youth guarantee, a guarantee of a place in education, training or job for every young person within four months of them leaving school. Providing the best start in life for our children, including new initiatives on family centres and school-based social work provision, a school transport contingency fund, as well as an overall increase in the education budget. Protecting our most vulnerable, including a new comprehensive taxi card scheme, extra help for those with dementia, a commitment to become a living wage accredited employer, investment in the region's first ever anti-poverty strategy, as well as an overall increase in the social work budget. Our budget demonstrated our commitment to be an inclusive council with a budget setting process that included a comprehensive public consultation process. The budget also set out proposals to deliver significant savings over the next three years, taking what was seen by local government in Scotland as a worst case scenario of cuts in the grants to councils of 1.6% per year by the Scottish Government. Our budget outlined how we would meet the challenge of savings £32 million over three years on top of the £40 million which had been saved in the previous four years. However, in what is the single biggest attack on local council budgets in a generation, the Scottish Government are proposing to triple the percentage cut in our grant for 2016 to 4.5%. The extent to which local councils are being singled out for significant cuts by the Scottish Government is revealed by the fact that the UK Government settlement to the Scottish Government for 2016-17 has actually increased by 0.7%. Whilst I do not believe that increase is enough, and I do not support the austerity policies of the UK Government, what the Scottish Government are imposing on local councils is austerity marks. If the Council settlement had moved in line with the modest increase in the Scottish Government's budget from the UK Government, our Council would have received a cash increase of approximately £2 million rather than a reduction. Unless there is a change of position by the Scottish Government when they set their budget towards the end of February, I think it's the 25th, the savings target we must now achieve for 2016-17 is £21.193 million rather than the anticipated target of 12.5 we set last year. Fortunately, due to the fact we did set a three-year budget last year, we have already agreed £8.162 million of savings for 2016-17. And because of the tough efficiency targets we set when agreeing that budget, officers have brought forward proposals for £3.054 million of operational savings and efficiencies. A review of the budget model has also released £1.674 million. A further £1.186 million has been identified due to the fact the service reviews we agreed have either found additional savings over and above the targets we set or they have been able to bring forward some savings from future years. Should members agree all those savings, this still leaves a £7.111 million gap. Further savings options of £5.661 million have been provided to groups from officers, which, if taken, would leave an outstanding target of £1.471 million to identify. Members could have agreed all the savings today, along with any others they have identified. However, as Section 6 of the report highlights, there are flexibilities open to members regarding the timing of our budget, particularly given the extent of funding reductions facing the Council and the lateness of the government settlement. It is my judgment and the view of the administration that a number of the savings options that have been provided to groups would be too damaging to our local services if taken. 
As an administration, we are developing a number of alternatives that we believe will minimise the impact on jobs and better protect frontline services. The Council, council normally sets its budget in mid-February for no other reason than it is a traditional to do so. Legally, we have till mid-March to agree the Council tax, although for practical purposes, the end of February is a more realistic deadline. Given the impact some of the proposed cuts will have in local communities, I think the public would be appalled if we just rubber stamped the savings before us without spending day and night trying to identify less damaging alternatives. I presume that is a view shared by all councillors, otherwise they would have put forward a budget for today. By waiting until the end of February before we set our budget, we can also keep the pressure on the Scottish Government and urge them, even at this late stage, to rethink the cuts before they set their budget. Our Council has until the 11th of March to set a budget for 2016-17. However, as I said, the, the end of February is a more practical deadline. I also believe that we must recognise that whilst the, Council, whilst the Scottish Government have only set a one-year budget, a full three-year government spending review will be carried out in 2016. The impact of this on Council funding is uncertain given the forthcoming election and the extent to which any, gov any future government is prepared to use the new tax rate powers under the Scotland Bill. However, it is possible that there could be further very significant funding reductions. I therefore believe that when updating the agreed three-year budget this year, members should not only put in place a balanced budget for 2016-17, but a budget process for next year that starts to identify further savings for future years. We need to open a dialogue with the public and ask them directly what services it is they want the Council to stop doing. It is no longer possible to simply keep trimming services year by year. Sadly, the debate is now about which services will be asked. As well as facing significant funding reductions when setting our budget, members will be aware that the Scottish Government has set a number of conditions on receiving the substantially reduced grant from the Scottish Government. The letter setting out the terms of the settlement to the President of COSLA, copied to Council leaders from the Deputy First Minister dated 27th of January, stated that failure to meet part of these requirements would result in a reduction in funding that would be, quote, proportionate and apply only to that element of the funding for a specific measure that a local authority subsequently does not deliver as set out in the paragraph above. Spotting a loophole in the thought-out letter from the Deputy First Minister, Moray Council asked whether this meant they could agree to his terms by letter, but if they then increased the Council tax, they would only lose that element of the funding associated with the council tax freeze. The Deputy First Minister promptly wrote back changing his make it up as he goes along budget proposals and stated to Moray Council that they would in fact lose all their funding if they did not freeze the council tax. Although this contradicts his letter sent out just 24 hours earlier and no doubt we'd be open to legal challenge, we should view the terms of the settlement as being part of an overall package. This means if our Council does not agree to accept the full requirements of the settlement, the combined penalty would be approximately £12.2 million, equivalent to approximately 20% on our Council tax. The first requirement is to freeze the Council tax for another year. As we set out in our budget discussions document, this has not been fully funded by the Scottish Government. In fact, Dumfries and Galloway is penalised by the way the Scottish Government has allocated the funding to freeze the council tax. Because we have the lowest council tax on mainland Scotland, however, given the threatened san sanctions, I believe we have no choice but to agree that any budget proposals that come forward from groups must contain a council tax freeze. The second requirement is to maintain the national people-to-teacher ratio of 13.7. Clearly, such an ill-thought-out requirement is one we have little control over as an individual council. However, we know that if the national target 
is not met, then the Scottish Government has said sanctions are likely to be applied against those council whose people to teacher ratio rises during the budget period. Perversely, this educationally illiterate policy means councils with people-teacher ratios above 13.7 can continue to keep the ratio above the national average, but our own council must stay at 12.7. Again, however, due to the threatened sanctions, I believe we should agree today that any budget proposals from groups for 2016-17 should build in a commitment to maintain a people-teacher ratio of 12.7 or below. Finally, the, the third requirement is to make progress towards the living wage by paying social care workers a living wage of £8.25 per hour from 1st October 2015. As a council, we are committed to rolling out the living wage. It was a motion from the Labour group, even in opposition, that led to our own council paying the living wage and last year, in our budget, we successfully proposed action that ensured we became the first ever living wage accredited council in Scotland. However, the reality is the £3.8 million allocated by the Scottish Government is unlikely to cover the cost of care providers paying a living wage of £8.25 per hour in a full year in Dumfries and Galloway, never mind any knock-on impact, providers of wage pressures caused by demands to maintain differentials. The allocation of funding is also a straight percentage allocation to each area with no recognition on the fact pay levels in Dumfries or Galloway are lower than most of the rest of Scotland, meaning it will be more expensive to meet the living wage in our area than other better paid areas. Consequently, Whilst any budget proposals cannot fully guarantee that this requirement will be met, I believe we should make a commitment to work with providers to deliver a living wage of £8.25 per hour from 1st of October, ensuring that a fair and equitable distribution of resources is given to providers to achieve this. I therefore wrote to the Deputy First Minister John Swinney before his deadline confirming that I will be proposing today that any budget that comes forward from political groups should clearly meet the terms of the settlement. I have also made it clear that this is due to the fact that the, the draconian conditions he is imposing would mean he would cut services in Dumfries and Galloway by a further £12.2 million if we did not adhere to those terms, on top of the £21.1 million of cuts his settlement will already result in. I am not prepared to allow the Scottish Government to make such further attacks on our local communities and services in Dumfries and Galloway. They are already doing enough damage. It is clear from the reaction across Scotland that the coercive manner in which the Deputy First Minister has imposed his settlement has all but destroyed the relationship between the Scottish Government and local councils and it will take many years to rebuild any trust between central and local government. In the meantime, it is the communities of Dumfries and Galloway, and indeed our own staff, who will have to bear the impact of the cuts he is imposing. I can, however, give them this commitment. This administration will work day and night to develop budget proposals that minimise the impact on job cuts including maintaining our council policy of no compulsory redundancies and we will protect as far as possible frontline services. Can I therefore move the recommendations as contained on page 15 of the administration's budget discussion document? If you want, I can go through them. I don't think that comment was actually very helpful and I think you know that kind of language uh, within the council is not, not conducive to productiveness. So uh, there's circus. Okay, does nobody anybody want me to go th through the recommendations? Okay, I'll go through the recommendations. Okay. Chair, that was a very detailed uh, statement you read out there. Um, one of the ones that sort of causes a wee bit of issue for me within your 
uh, recommendation was the two and five days for the publication. Uh, my understanding is that the Scottish Government plans to set their budget on the 25th. Yep. Now, if it's five days before the 29th, that's the 24th, we won't have that information. Would it be possible to uh, delete that part so that possibly we can actually have the budget on the day? The other one was, with regard to your document, I was trying to write down the interesting points you were bringing up. I might have missed one. Could you remind me, um, was it 1.471 million was the difference? On what? It might be better if we could get a copy of your statement, possibly, yeah, and have uh, a wee No, no problem with that. Recess. All the details are in there. Um, yep, you can have that. Could we just have a copy of the statement and a recess so that we can read it and then come back? A lot of the details are actually in I, there. I know, but there was... With the percentages and the figures as well. I think it would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Andy. Uh, thanks, Leader. Um, I, I accept there's been a lot of factors at play here, you know, going right away back to George Osborne delaying the autumn statement, and I don't think we're going to need to go too much into that um, and in the interaction between us and the Scottish Government in the period of clarification and everything else. Chair, sorry, point of order. I thought if somebody called for a recess, that took precedent. Sorry, I misunderstood you there. I thought you were just wanting the, the details. I asked for a recess. I asked for a copy of the statement and a recess. All oh, right, sorry. I've just wanted a copy. Yeah. Okay. So we'll get copies printed and we'll have a recess for 15 minutes. Fine. Thanks. Maybe a slightly longer. I don't know. Half okay, that's, that's fine. Yeah. No, that'll go ahead just now. Uh, no, lead, leader, it might be uh, asked uh, Jill's. Uh, for Burns to actually let me speak first before you have that, I'll tell you why. Is because we might then have to have a further recess, given what I'm saying, and we could actually cover the two in one. Okay, right. So okay. Well, normal practice would be that if somebody calls for a recess, we have a recess first, and then if somebody else wishes to speak after that, then that would be it. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll, I'll take this. I'll take Andy's comments first before I call before I call the recess. The, th thanks very much, Leader. Um, I, I, I think that's the common sense approach on this occasion rather than being too uh, hogtied here by uh, process. Um, I, I think we're all agreed here that um, there's been a significant delay in the times allowable for everyone to, to come up with some budget uh, amendments. And a, I, we just have to put on record, you know, it was unfortunate that elected members and senior staff actually read about the offer in the media rather than having actually had a personal um, or it been shared with elected members directly. That, having said that, um, you know, if we don't enter into that dialogue with opposition leaders early and call for a full council emergency meeting, for example, you'd had a mandate when you went up to the, meet on the 29th. But that's a different matter. Having said that, what we actually need now is some calm reflection here. We need some, and some serious consideration because this is the future of the Peace and Galway. The people we're talking about here, right, whether, whatever our political leanings are. So what, what I'm just saying is... We Andy, have, Andy, can you bring it to a, you know, a conclusion what you're trying to what well, you're well, asking? Well, the question well, is, I'm not here to listen to any speeches. You asked me and well, I'll give you the courtesy <laughs> of having... Right. Well, right, I have to put into context what, what, I'm, what I'm going to move. Right, as we had to sit through your political speech, we had you respect, Leader, and what I'm asking... Excuse saying, me, yeah, Councillor, right, that wasn't a political speech, that was an administration speech by the Leader right, of the Council. Well, OK. To the, OK, well, there's no split hairs on that one. OK, so we are happy to go to um, agree with recommendations 5, 6 and 7, right? If we get the Section 95 officers uh, confirmation that the capital programme will be agreed on the 29th as well, because that's no clear in the papers, or either uh, uh, the amended paper. And the other thing is I would like to add an eighth recommendation, um, a, a, a number eight on the bottom recommendations uh, that, the, that the class got with you, and we've got copies there, and that, that the administration agrees to follow their example set out in Appendix 2 of the 2015-16 budget, 
and that they will engage with other political groups in good time for other political groups to meet the deadlines as set out in Recommendation 6. And can I just say on that, Andy, that, you know, my position has always been, and it, it hasn't changed, it hasn't changed from last year or any other time, you know, that my door was open for any political group to come and speak to me regarding uh, budget proposals. Unfortunately, the only one that didn't come and speak to me was the SNP. Every other group came and they spoke with me on their budget proposals. So if there's anything that goes back, you know, it's your own fault for not engaging sooner. So yeah. I'm now going to call for a, uh, leader. a recess. I, that's it. Okay, recess. I think everybody's had time to look through them, so... Um, either. Thank you, Leader. It's just a couple of points of clarification, please. One was on the, the figures. They slightly differ from what's in the, the budget proposal. Uh, it's just a slight difference. Is that due to rounding, if you could confirm that to me? And the other one was the necessity for the dates. Um, the current process is two days before they're published. Is that working day? Because currently we don't abide by that because we receive them at the end of the Friday and they're published on the Monday. So that's just one full working day uh, to, from the budgets being given to Paul to actually coming out and being published. So you just confirm that as well, please. The first one in the figures is, is rounding. So it might be 1.411 and 50,000 or something. Else. But, but, okay, but it's rounded down. The other one, Paul? Yes, it is two working days. I appreciate that because of the, the timing of uh, a meeting on a Thursday, we're actually receiving the proposals on a Friday night and releasing them on a Monday, which is only formally one working day. Obviously, I didn't want to release them on a, a Sunday night necessarily. <laughs> Uh, and I felt as though the combination of the one working day and the Monday plus a bit of time over the weekend gives us sufficient time to review and assure ourselves with regard to budget proposals. So it is two working days. Oh, Ian. Thanks, Leader. I was going to come in on it's when you do get to recommendations. I think what I've put forward is quite sensible. And when we get to recommendation six, we'll certainly be moving the fact that when you go down, you go down about four sentences part of recommendation six referring to your uh, proposal that you put out yesterday, just to, to remove, after put a full stop after pr procurement and remove the rest of the wording. We think we should be able to, because it, I mean, it, it helps us, gives us more time, more flexibility, it gives the groups a chance to, to talk and discuss with each other, and we can actually work it out in the day. We've done that many times in the past, and I think that's fair. So long as they've been past the section, some, uh, section 95 officer and the, the, the head of legal, that's, that's what we need to comply with. As long as they're competent on the day, I think that's the fundamental here. And we'll, when we get to that point, uh, unless you move them in block, we'd look to change it and, and remove that word then, uh, leader. Well, I have no intention of changing that. That's part of the budget process. Anybody, anybody remember? Jo? Um, thank you, leader. It would just be on that um, particular point. Um, I understand that everything needs to be impact assessed. So you, you know, we would need to have a time to do that. That's why we determined that we couldn't table a budget on the day, because how would it be in fact assessed otherwise? So I think we need to come to some kind of a agreement over that. I would also have to say that we're millions short. I would give no assurance, to not allow the Section 95 officer to give any assurance and deliverability if he intended to do a budget on the day. Also, he would not be able to do the impact assessments in the period in time. You know, uh, but I have no budget in front of me. So in the next two weeks, I need a budget for £350 million. Pounds. I need to assess the deliverability and give you assurance that we as officers and directors will commit to deliver it. That can't be done in the day. Um, so, but it's in members, it's part of members' decision process. Jane. Um, th thank you very much. Um, Leader, can you tell me whether or not um, we've had any indication um, whether any sort of impact assessment was done on our economy 
as a low-wage economy, a rural economy, um, with respect to um, imposing £8.25 on our um, workforce, because there will be an effect upon other employers. Inevitably, there's bound to be some sort of churn and effect. Um, so my understanding is that um, we, because we are so isolated and rural and different to other areas, are starting from a much lower base and will be using up that money very much more quickly. In fact, actually, my understanding is it will be totally swallowed up um, in, in, the, in the change from the current position, which is probably about 670, the, living, the, uh, the minimum wage for many people, um, up to 825, which is an increase of about 25%. So I, I just wonder whether any sort of thought that you know of has come down to consider what that will do to us in such a quick, quick process. The, the short answer for me is no. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that is, you know, I've no issue at all with the £8.25 uh, you know, living wage. I've absolutely no problem at all with that. But the way it's been done is a haphazard. It's uh, ill thought out. There's been no uh, re relationship with councils on the actual impact. Actually, you know, in my first letter to John Swinney, I asked him to come down and, um, you know, I would speak to him regarding all the impact it has on the, the area so that he could then assure me if he wanted that this is uh, the way he's got to handle that. But unfortunately, he didn't even have the courtesy to answer my letter. Didn't even acknowledge my letter. I have written to him again. Uh, and this is why, you know, I, I think it's important that we do keep the pressure up on the Scottish Government before there's three stages to the bill. First one's passed, there's another two stages to go. So hopefully, I don't, you know, I wouldn't hang by the hung by a thread with it, the, the, the outcome of these meetings, if we eventually have one, but at least we've got an understanding of where he's coming from about, and he would have an understanding about the impact on the region. But, you know, I just don't know. I don't know where he is. Thank you. Um, maybe um, we could possibly have some... Um, help from our own colleagues here as to, 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 to explain to their own people um, that this actually really might well have some serious effect upon us, not the same way as on other, other, uh, other councils. Um, the other thing, actually, um, leader, is that um, when you said, absolutely, you're right, it was a motion from a Labour group that led to your own council paying the living wage, that, of course, was £7.20 anticipated those. It wasn't 8.25. I think we should be quite clear about that. Yeah, but it does go up as well on prices. Anyway, um, Andy, then Willie. Um, thanks, Leader. It's a straightforward procedural question. The capital programme, can I just get confirmation that it will actually be decided on the 29th? I just need a nod of the head on that one. Yes. Really? Thanks, Chair. I get a sense of deja vu. It almost uh, takes me back, you know, when the announcement was made of the kinship care where 10 million was going to be made available when it fell well short of what is actually needed throughout the whole of Scotland to, to, to meet that parity uh, and the difficulties we have, but nevertheless, we, we've got to meet them. I think you and the Labour administration are to be commended on the proposal on uh, the living wage, and I've been in discussion talking to Archie about it, and I hope that will cover agency workers as well that we engage with uh, in that respect. So, uh, you know, whether it's imposed from UK government or, or, or uh, you as an administration and we as a council take the bold step of moving forward, I would commend you for, for, for taking that step forward, and let's try and race. Uh, the, the, the economy of the area by putting up something in the people's pocket. So I would commend you on that one, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we've got Ian. Thanks, Leader. Just, just going back to the, the response from our Chief Executive, which I understand where he's coming from, but what, I was, certainly wasn't proposing that we come forward with incompetent proposals. There hadn't been impact assessed. I think I made it as clear as I could that there would have been impact assessed, been passed the Section 95 officer, and uh, head illegal as as per the, the recommendations. 
it just it's the point of time. The reason I'm asking for this particular uh, recommendation to be changed is because we've got a further announcement for the Scottish Government. It gives us the maximum amount of time to take it in consideration all aspects when it comes to the budget. And keen to hear what other people are saying in other groups. But certainly, as we go to the recommendations, I'll look to move that, uh, Leader, as being competent as well. Take advice in regards to that when it comes to that point, but I would move that we, we don't have to uh, have them in within that specific timeline. We can leave that, leave that to the, the day if required, uh, but certainly they need to be impact assessed and, and fully competent. Jim. Thanks, Leader. Presumably the 825 payment now has to be written into the social provider's contract. Uh, can I perhaps give, take members back a step that, that we've mentioned the living wage and, and unfortunately the um, cabinet secretary's living wage, the national living wage is actually the term for £7.20. It's the new minimum wage definition. So I think members need to be careful, which particularly when we talk to the public, that there are different living wages out there. Um, uh, but we also have the challenge that our providers need to pay £7.20 from April. And, and members be aware from the Social Work Committee that we've been working with them very closely and how we would achieve that daunting target. The, the move to £8.25 uh, will need to be reflected in contracts, but you cannot, as members will know, change one contract for one staff group without changing the contracts to the other staff groups within the business. It's a hugely complex issue. Absolutely the right thing to do, but we have a whole um, raft of things to move through. Members may also be aware that all the providers are being faced with a 2.5% superannuation increase this year. Again, that's come through as part of the, the regulations from Westminster. So therefore, they're having to deal with an enormous cost pressure and this pressure, and we need to work out a fair and equitable method to ensure funding goes forward. The other point is we have no legal power to insist they pay £8.25. So that is another complicating factor we need to work and bring something back to members on the practicalities of how we would do this. But there's nothing in the letter from the Cabinet Secretary at this point that tells us what happens if we do everything we possibly can to achieve it, but a provider doesn't. We're also not in a situation where we are over-provided in home care. So therefore, there's a, you know, it's very important that we send the right signals out and we work very closely, but these are some of the complexities we'll have to work through. And it's only from now till October, so it's a very short time scale to deal with those issues. But I say the first issue we have to deal with is seven pounds twenty from the first of April. So um, you know there's an awful lot of work to be done in the in that period. Colin. Thanks, Leader. It's just on the point that, that Ian makes about the timing. I mean, the reality is we've come a long way since the days where the budget was set by one piece of paper tabled on the morning of the meeting and everybody huddled into little rooms tweaking the figures here and there. Those were the days, of course, when we had more money to spend and we weren't looking for £21.1 million worth of cuts. It's completely inconceivable that we could have a situation where a, a group can table a budget on the day of the meeting and actually fully expect that to be properly assessed and properly debated by members. We've got to find £21.1 million worth of savings. Everybody knows now that budgets are accompanied by individual savings templates for all those options. £21.1 million worth of templates is a lot of pieces of paper. You could be talking hundreds of, of, of templates uh, from various different groups. You cannot seriously expect to table that in the morning of a meeting and expect members then to make a decision on a budget and be able to properly assess each of those individual templates that they haven't seen until the morning of the meeting in some cases. So I think that's completely impractical way to, to go forward and, and frankly it's taken us back instead of forward. I mean the reality is if, if Councillor Crothers can't table a budget three days before a meeting then frankly I'd question his ability to table a budget on the day of the meeting. Either. Leader, in light of what the Chief Executive said about the knock-on effect of the, the living wage, is it prudent to look at the the review of the budget model, which released 1.674 million. Is that prudent to include that as a saving if it's going to have a bigger effect, this £8.25, on other staffing as well? And should we not 
maybe have to accept that that needs to be kept as a payment and therefore uh, if we need it for social services because if we're going to have more money and more impact than what has been budgeted for I'm led to believe is it something like the, the estimated cost is five million we're getting three million or something like that so there's a gap so would it not be better to leave that money in there just now I think we're starting to get now, down to the detail of our budget now. Um, I mean, I'm, I think you know the officers will be very happy to engage on that one. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've, we've got. Sorry, Andy. Thanks, leader. Um, I just wanted to quick comment comment on the impact assessments because you're right the section 95 officer is obviously integral integral to that but is not the only uh, not exclusively the person who's uh, looks at it there's a, others to check to make sure that things are legal and blah 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 in a different format so whilst ian's comments are well intentioned i, I don't think they're practical i think is, is my thing here um, i'm coming back to um the the bottom of your page two and page three of your, of your speech leader, because it's the easiest way to refer to it, um, about the dialogue with the public and everything else. Um, that was the driver for my asking to put, um, or prepared to put forward um, an eighth recommendation. Now, um, I'd be happy to, I mean, there, there are copies there to be shared out, but what I'm saying here quite clearly is that you have to be fair, you set a good example in 2015-16, and we should follow that good example this year. Um, we, we have a three-year budget, and it's our view that it's the administration's job to amend their budget, and then us comment whether that we can get consensus or we can agree or not. Now, that's, that's a, um, th there may be a difference in opinion here, but that's why we're prepared to move what we've got. Tom. It was not the administration's budget. Once that budget was accepted, it's the council's budget. It doesn't belong to any political group. It's the council's budget. End off. Okay, I'm going to go to the recommendation. We've got a motion. We've got a motion on the table. I, 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 yesterday, I'll just be able to be saying we're agreeing with everything up until um, we should ask for um, a, an, a, an extra recommendation that you agree to follow the example set out in Appendix 2 of um, the 2015-16 budget uh, um, uh, setting paper, right? And that they will engage with other political groups in good time so that other political groups can meet the deadlines as set out in Recommendation 6. I don't, as I explained to you before, I don't think there's any need for that because that is a that is a process. We're actually doing that. But if you're wanting it in again twice, yeah, that, that's that's fine. But it is part of the process. So you know, it's so I don't see what's to be gained by it, but but if, if that's what you want, yeah. So uh, so leader, does that mean you're agreeing it, yeah? I only, only agree to put it in if it's if my secondary agrees to put it in, yeah. But it's uh, happy to go. Yeah, it's actually in the process. But anyway, Ian. Thanks, Lee. I just go back to the point I made earlier. I would take into consideration page 15. I'd like to move that apart from uh, recommendation six. Page 15 of the document you released yesterday morning, I think it was. Recommendation six, I would like to make sure that it's qualified as being competent first in the first place, but uh, put a full stop after procurement. And that allows us to present a fully competent budget on the day if required. If we can get that qualified first as being competent, that's what it would move as a, an amendment, Leader. Okay, we've got a motion. We've got a seconder for the amendment. Hey, leader, I'll second Councillor Carlos. Leader. 
Good amendment. I, I appreciate the sentiments in both the, 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 the motion and the amendment, but I think there maybe is a compromise that we could reach if we agreed six as it, as it is, but add, should there be any significant change to the Scottish Government's budget, budget proposal on the 25th of February, it will be permissible to revise any submitted budget proposal by the Council. Sounds reasonable. Right, so we. Okay, I'm going in a minute. So ours is uh, the keeping in six with. If there's any major changes from the Scottish government budget, then it will be revisited. That's, that's fine. <laughs> and Andy's number eight, which yeah, Andy's number eight. Okay, Ian. That's Lydia. If. Subject to that being agreed, which I think both yourself and the deputy has agreed, we would remove our amendment. Okay, so we've agreed the recommendations as laid out with the changes. Okay. Okay, move on to item five. There are no budget proposals on the table. Been tabled today, therefore I have no further business and we close the meeting. Sorry, j just before you go, I've been asked by the uh, Unison if um, people are wanting to meet at half past one on the no compulsory redundancies, no uh, cuts to council budgets, they're, they're having something at half past one. Uh, bring your signs. No swinny cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Half past one. Outside. Uh, uh, uh.